Okay, hello everybody. So Kinesiology for Kids. Um, so it, it's a course that I've been running for, um, I think five years now. So I've run it, this will be my seventh time I've run it. But I think I just, I have so much to talk about with kids. And sorry, if you don't know me, my name's Emma Sternberg. I'm a kinesiologist. I've been a kinesiologist for 15 years. Um, and when I first started working with kids, my parents laughed at me because I just, I had no idea about kids at all, had no interest in working with kids. I didn't even know if I wanted kids myself and I, I got thrown in the deep end. I really did. So uh, the principal of the college, um, hey, Nadine, just put yourself on mute. Um, hang on. Um, so the principal of my college, invited me to come and work for him after I finished graduating and he worked with um, learning difficulties, ADHD, disabilities, that kind of thing, autism and I just fell in love. I just I really really loved working with these kids and spending time with them and helping them and then I ended up um, I guess I'm going into my journey here so um, and then I ended up working as I was studying my bachelor, um, I worked as a nanny, I worked in um, an autism program, I worked in childcare, and I just threw myself into figuring out what it is that kids needed um, and what made them tick and why. I was really, you know, and I think this is, you know, I've always been interested in the nervous system. It's why I wanted to be a kinesiologist in the first place. I really wanted to figure out why people felt the way that they did. That's kind of always been my driver. Why? Why do they feel that way? Why do they feel that way? And um, so I started, I started kind of examining kids and um, falling in love with who they were, who their little personalities were, and really starting to see that no matter what they were diagnosed with, Sometimes, you know, particularly working in childcare, sometimes you just, you get thrown into seeing the disorder rather than the child. And I think that's where we're really going astray with kids is that it's, everything's about diagnosing and helping a disorder. You know, whether you're ADHD or autism, or it's like a dysfunction, even dyslexia, it's like a dysfunction that's seen. Um, and it's not, it's not always a dysfunction. You know, we've got well, the, the phrase being, you know, used at the moment is neurodiversity. And it's not, it's really not just a um, throwaway comment, you know, it really is. And in a way, I think that the last couple of years and what we've been through, hopefully is starting to disintegrate the education system a little bit, hopefully, you know, because it's just, it's not suiting most of our kids. And life is really nervous system stimulating. And then we're expecting our kids to be well behaved and to keep up with everything and be emotionally aware, but strong at the same time and, and fast paced. And it's like, we're pulling the, you know, even yesterday I had a child who, um, she was four, wasn't, um, wasn't going to the toilet, like wasn't doing a poo on the toilet and, I'd seen her friend who also didn't do poos on the toilet. So the other girl had a whole heap of anxiety and sensory stimulation and everything going on. And so it was really about a sensory issue for her. But this little girl I saw yesterday, um, her issue was more that mom just did everything for her and she followed along. There was no sense of autonomy in her life at all. And I guess, you know, having that, nappy on and being able to go away and be private for a little minute it's kind of like what we do as parents right it's like I just need my 10 minutes alone to go and poo on my own <laughs> um you know and it was just that sense of no well I don't I don't do anything on my own and there was no sense of internal responsibility so I guess you know what I'm seeing is that we have these issues in our society but there's so many different reasons why we have the issues with the ADHD you know there's so many different reasons why a child might have ADHD they might have true ADHD where their brain development does need some help their frontal lobe um 
you know, needs a little bit of more stimulation to make those neural connections and we need to find out why. Or it might be that their diet is rubbish and they can't concentrate because their diet is rubbish, you know, or they're just not getting enough nutrients or energy or that their reflexes are still active and they're, they're fighting against their nervous system or they're dealing with so much emotionally or there's been trauma in there. And so sitting and learning is far beyond what their nervous system actually feels is necessary at the moment. Um, you know, and then there's auditory processing. You know, there's so many different reasons why we um, why we have issues in kids, and that's what I love about being a kinesiologist. It, it, we really try and figure out why things are going on, what is the actual reason underneath this. Whereas, when you're working in the field, you know, most therapies just go, "Okay, that's the diagnosis," and you can do this, this, and this to help it. But what you actually realise is that they're not helping it, they're training. And, you know, what you'll actually realise once you can't, once you work with kids is that a, a, a human being will naturally want to evolve and grow and develop and be peaceful. And uh, every human wants to be peaceful. And when we're not, we become dysfunctional. And, you know, we don't need to train ourselves to be peaceful. We need to figure out why we're not. And it's either emotional or nervous system or breathing. That's kind of it. Like, why don't we feel safe enough to feel peaceful? And really, you know, whatever whatever kind of techniques you use or anything else, it's really about trying to find out why aren't we peaceful? What happened to make you feel not safe in the world? And what happened to make you question and what doesn't make sense to you? You know, in order to feel safe in the world, we actually need to find understanding of what's happening. And when there's so much input or when we're um, being told one thing, but then behaviour, you know, what we see is different. And that's a big thing in trauma as well. You know, whether you're working with adults or children in trauma and particularly with kids with... Um, disruptive divorces in their life and stuff like that you know it's it's very it's very confusing often because what they're being told but what what they see and feel are very two very different things and so they learn not to trust themselves and they learn not to trust adults and they learn not to trust the world as well because it doesn't make sense it doesn't click you know what that feeling is like when you finally understand something it's like ah, oh, okay now I get the picture and so often what I'm doing with kids is helping them to understand what's going on and what they're feeling and why they're feeling it. Um, so that's also what we go into in the course is, okay, what is each age group and what are they trying to seek understanding of at that age? Because each developmental phase you learn to review and self-reflect in a different way. Um, you know, so under two is very much about your safety core needs and um, under eight, it's very much about you personally, which is why when we go back into the inner child work, we often have to tell that inner child that it wasn't your fault. It's because under, under eight, the world is centred around you. You know, you you are responsible for everything that happens to you. Um, and then as you get older, you start to express anger towards the people around you and anger towards the world because you realise, well, hang on. <laughs> You're not acting like that person. You start reviewing more other people and how they're reacting to things, which is why, you know, often at 10 you start to get these kids go, I can't cope, I don't want to be here anymore, all this kind of stuff is because they're starting to lose control of the world and the people around them don't make sense. They've learnt to distrust the people around them because they're fighting with each other or they're unhappy or they're taking their anger and aggression out on the child or their world is in chaos, you know, or something's not being explained somewhere. They don't feel safe and held in the world. You know, before you have teenagehood, you have to feel... So you go from this little child, so zero to two, 
you're really being held and protected and you have to be held and then it's like your own emergence into the into the world like I'm safe the world is being held for me but I have my own inner experience now and then nine or ten you're starting to step out into that outer world and starting to try and have a little bit of influence and say and interaction with that outer world um, so you're trying to understand the world on a greater scale and then you know as you hit teenagehood okay you you become start becoming the world around you or you start wanting to forge your own path in that world and I say to parents you know parenting really stops at 14 your your ability to tell a child what or what not to do and just leave it at that stops at 14 you know from 14 you really have to grow their own independence in the world and, and start trusting them you know otherwise you're going to get a child who can't trust themselves out in the world and they're not going to learn how to fail and everything and so you get these kids going through you know and I, t I tend to find if they're going through an identity shift before 16 then we're pretty safe you know we're, I say that we're pretty safe you know if you start experimenting with life um, relationships life boundaries and things like that before 16 you usually get a shift after 16 because that that period of 14 to 15 16 is really about it's in a way it's like a purging of your own emotions you you start to try and figure out who you are emotionally and feel into those emotions and want to express those emotions I want to understand again that understanding of why do I feel this way what are my emotions why do I feel this way which is why kids in pain will attract other kids in pain it's because you get you understand you that feels familiar to me my anger feels familiar um and so if they start experimenting around that age you know wanting to express those feelings I tend to find after 16 things settle a little bit if you suppress a child until after 16, I tend to find you've got a lot more of a journey. Like I always get a bit more worried when I'm getting eating disorders at 16, 17, 18, because I know, okay, we're kind of, we're here for a bit of drug issues and stuff. We're kind of here for a bit more of a longer journey. Um, you know, because it, it it's now affecting your real sense of identity and who I am and how, and it's starting to formulate those patterns of how you interact with the world. The other thing I'll kind of note about teenagers here is that you tend to do an emotional review. So 12, 2, 13, 3, 14, 4. You know, what, what emotions was I dealing with at that age? Um, what was going on in my world? What don't I understand? What relationships need reviewing? Um, again, that understanding that communication and that expression of self. And if that's not heard, then we hold that as tension. And then we know how that tends to work out for adulthood as well. Um, so really the key with kids is, is learning to figure out what it is they need to express and what it is they need to understand about themselves and the world. And the key is that they don't actually need a lot of solving. So most of what you're doing with kids isn't actually like we would with adults maybe is more correction, processing, that kind of thing. With kids, it's actually more about the finding of the issue and finding that key issue. Because once it's expressed, they feel so much better. <laughs> it's like that aha moment. Like they don't need... I, and again, you know, men are a little bit the same when you work with men in clinic. It's like you, I work for an hour and a half with women, but an hour for men. It's like <laughs> because they don't need that deep internal processing of emotion. They just need to understand what's happening, what they're feeling, that verbalization of you're sad. Oh, oh yeah, I'm sad. Okay, I get it. All right. Okay, that makes more sense now. I'm sad because this happened or I'm worried because this happened. Um, and there's been many, many cases where, you know, 
you find this big deep realization and the kid is fine after that they're like okay what's for dinner they'll completely change the subject and the first time the first couple of times it happened I thought that they were avoiding but they weren't they they had they had processed it um you know it just made sense and the reason you can see that is it's a body language thing so you learn to with kids you really learn to examine body language and you learn to all those tiny little nuances in their feet and their shoulders and their gut and their breathing so when you're working with a child in clinic who's overstimulated what will tend to happen is that if they don't understand so a child will often come into the clinic and if they don't feel safe in the world there'll be one of two responses they will sit with mum and curl in or three maybe they won't want to come in in the first place or they'll walk around the room <laughs> and they'll examine everything yeah and okay so there's there's three different ways of working with those kids so you've got the kids who curl into mum I don't force them on the table so you're 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 setting up a relationship with a child you don't just walk in for a session or two. You, you, you're there for the long haul with them. I, um, I had a kid in this week who came up from Sydney and um, he's just had his first breakup and, and stuff like that. And, you know, is it going into year 12? And he's this most adorable human being. And so he's around, he's 17 now. And I've been seeing him since he was six or seven. And, you know, when we were trying to get him to school and this all this social anxiety and stuff like that so you go on this huge journey with them you know there's been so much that's happened in his life he's lost a parent you know he's he's and you're just on this journey with them um you know and it's such a beautiful beautiful thing to be part of the families and part of what's going on in the world you know because growing up is hard so just to have a base for someone to talk to all the time it's just it's incredible I love it um but you know you've got the the kids who curl up and again you know you, your job is to really make them feel as safe as possible with your first rather than any treatments you have to make them feel safe um so if the first couple of sessions all I'm doing is getting them to trust me that's fine and we just limit the sessions to half an hour. So they come in, they sit on the couch with mum. So I've got a little couch here. Um, and I, you know, I'll, I'll teach you some techniques in the course, but, you know, I do te te techniques with them on the couch with mum. And then I only get them up on the table when they're ready to. So I'll ask them all the time, do you want to hop up on the table? Do you want to hop up on the table? And then you know, there will be a day where they want to get up on the table where they trust me enough. The kids who don't want to come in the room, you've got to remember that there's a fight or flight reaction, right? So the, but the first step is fight or flight is to, shut, is to shut down and then they want to run away and then they want to fight you. Yeah, so if you're getting kids who are having meltdowns in the clinic and angry and running and, you know, that means that you've missed those first two stages and they have felt so unsafe and backed into a corner and they have lost all understanding of what's happening to the point where they're now fighting you and having a meltdown. So you've got to be better aware at how to handle those first two stages. So the kids who won't come in in the clinic, absolutely fine. I'll leave the door open. I'll sit with mum. We'll have a chat or dad or whoever it is. I'll say to them, come in when you're ready, you know, um, you can wait out in the waiting room. Um, I have been known to have a little chat in the waiting room and then just say, okay, we're going to try again next week. Um, and mostly, again, it comes down to understanding. They're, they're scared because they don't understand what's going to happen in that room, what's expected of them. Most probably they've been, you know, being um, told they have bad behaviour. You know, it's, it's not it's not good behaviour. Uh, so I make sure that they know that they're not in trouble with me. I'm not here to tell them what's wrong or right with them. They're here. They're going to have a little chat and have a little massage. That's it. Um, you know, they I've got a big weighted blanket. If you can invest in one of those, I highly, highly recommend. Um, 
yeah, particularly those those teenagers, they, you know, even the 14-year-old boys, they come in and they're all tough and then they get under the blanket and they're like, so this happened today. <laughs> and it's just gorgeous, um, you know, and there's the kid, and it's a really telling sign as well, you know, if kids don't want the blanket on, you know, they really want control and they don't like to be held and they're really not trusting of the world. Something's happened to make them stop trusting in the world. You know, there's some sort of conflict there. So again, those kind of things will, you know, if they want the blanket, you can very much guarantee that they feel held at home and they want to be held. Um, so again, it, it's and it's also helping the parent to understand their child and what the behaviour is is saying. Again, we've gotten caught on behaviour being a dysfunction rather than trying to understand what what drives behaviour. So with the kids who refuse to come in, you know, it's not a behavioural thing. You have to make that really, really clear. Like they're scared and overwhelmed and it's not something that you have to push them into. We need to find out what's going to make them feel safe enough to enter the room. What is it that they need in that moment? What what needs to be explained? What are they afraid of? What's happened in the past? That kind of thing. Um, and then the kids who, again, walk around the room, they'll become really hyperactive. Um, they'll tend to tolerate a little bit of touch and then they'll want to exit the room for a little bit. So they'll say, can I go now? Can I go now? Can I go now? And if a child is saying, can I go now? That means that I need time to process what's just happened. So I'll actually let them, if they're old enough, I'll just let them, I'll say, you know, go for a walk, go to the bathroom and then come back. Or I'll even let them jump from the table to the couch and just have a little moment to breathe. And then I'll, I'll talk to mum, we'll have a little bit, either a general chat or what's going on. Um, and then I'll just say, when you're ready, you jump back on the table. If they're really little, I'll, I've got a hallway here and I'll do some skipping down the hallway with them, you know, get them to discharge that energy of needing to run away. So you don't stop that energy, you need to discharge it. And that's why kids are fleeing the classroom and school and everything else is because they've just, their nervous systems have reached a point where they're saying that's enough, I can't handle anymore. So, you know, life becomes a little bit too much for one of these kids. There's not enough processing time and creativity time and expression time. And we're trying, we really are trying, I think, as, as particularly over the last couple of years, we've really craved that, we've gotten that. Um, or we've got a sense of it and we don't want to go back to busy. So it's, you know, I can see a lot of positive changes starting to happen for, for people. Um, but, you know, whatever acronym you're kind of working with, ODD, ADHD, or, to, you know, the spectrum, ASD, dyslexia all that kind of stuff so dyslexia is beautiful like I love working with dyslexic kids I really want to point out that dyslexia isn't an issue <laughs> it's 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 a way of viewing the world that is 3d 5d you know whatever you want to call it it's beyond what we see they they kind of look beyond what we've been told and question more outside of that box and so when you have these simplistic kind of written down language it's not engaging enough it's confusing to the mind because you, it, they've got to feel things they've got to sense things you know that's that's dyslexic's um gift is that they feel into things you know you've got yeah, yeah, he can solve, yeah, so um, someone said here, my son's dyslexic and, you know, they're thriving at work because he can solve the problems others can't, exactly, they just have this other view. Einstein was dyslexic, John Lennon, Richard Branson, you know, all these impressive minds and I tend to find that they do really well with that um, hands-on stuff. So when you've got a teacher who just, you know, you want to just copy things from the board or the book all the time, of course they're going to be falling behind and losing concentration and stuff like that. Um, but when you're working with all the other acronyms, you know, there's so many different reasons why things, why kids struggle. 
and that's what I go through in the course is okay what are the reasons why what's the underlying here and even in all my procedures that I do I look at well what actually causes this thing in the first place and how do we treat the underlying causes um, so basically it's six weeks of that you know okay what's the cause why what is it and how do we help it um, that's kind of like a huge blur down <laughs> of working with kids but has anyone got any questions anything um that they're concerned with with working with kids um often a big question in the course is parents and and how to handle parents um i go into all of this in the course but i love having the parent present because i need to understand the child you know you're only part of this child's wor world for half an hour an hour every now and again so um so the, the parent really needs to understand what the behaviour is saying and why. Um, and they need to hear the child speak. And if you're encouraging the child to speak without the parent there, I don't think that that necessarily really works. Um, because what will happen is when you're bringing up something emotional for the child that has to do with the parent, instantly you've got an emotional reaction with the parent. You know, the parent has brought the child here. They care about the child. <laughs> they're paying good money. You know, they're not they're not just doing a process. You know, we're private. So they're paying good money to see us. They want answers and they want to help their child. So having the child bring up their issue with their parent in while well, the parent's in the room, you get to act as that mediator and you get to, you know, the child gets to see the parent's emotional reaction to what's going on as well. Um... You know, and you get to kind of explain to the parent why the child is feeling that way. You get to show non-judgment um, to the parent. So you kind of diffuse that guilt, shame feeling that the parent's feeling in that moment because it's probably just patterning that they've learned or that they're struggling with. Or you get to tell the child, you know, see mum, you know, or dad, they really do care. <laughs> uh, hey, Kelly. Hi. Um, do you, is there any particular um, issues or at point that a child will come in that they need to be referred onto um, some sort of other specialist? Like is there a, a cutoff point in some sort of issues or that you just think, okay, this needs to go or you need to work with yeah. other specialists? Yeah, there's, there's lots of different reasons. So um, I kind of went through a phase where I didn't, you know, I thought diagnosis wasn't a key thing but I think since the NDIS has rolled out it really has helped um, get funding and support for for kids so um, you know if it's not so much about labeling the child it's more about you know getting funding for the child and, and the support at school and stuff like that so I'll refer to a psychologist if there's trauma um, as in like abuse or you know abusive trauma um i've got a social worker here that i'll work with as well so that we can keep she's really good at helping me um keep tabs on with with the um what's it facts and stuff like you know the family um oh, i can't remember it used to be docs i can't remember it's facts now i can't remember the acronym family and community services um, so she'll help me, you know, determine, okay, do we need to write reports? Do you already know, you know, does the social um, system already, are they already aware of this child and all that kind of stuff? Um, so there, she's really good at that. Um, I've got a naturopath that I'll refer to when I, when I think the pyrroles or MTHFR is involved, you know, you need to go into that more biochemical mix. Um, I've got chiros that help me with the you know, I'm I'm quite booked out now, so I don't get to see people every week so much. So I've got other therapists that might do the stuff in between. So I'll see them maybe every month or two months, and then they'll do the body work in between. Um, you know, so there's yeah, so there's lots of different therapy. You know, I'll often work with a speech or an OT or something. We're we're, we're not the be all and end all at all, um, and just making sure that you're communicating or on the same page with those therapies as well. So in your own community, it's really important to have a sense of professionalism 
in that network and, and being able to communicate with everyone. So you don't need any big special reports like I used to think that's what we needed because that was professional and then I realized that the professionals were literally sending me two word email you know two sentence emails like working on this thanks very much <laughs> you know like can you can you review that for me um and so you know so we'll often just do emails um to each other um yeah how does yeah so that's that's kind of it um and then, you know, as well, it's it's a really good, because, uh, you know, so many of those APRA-based services are booked out in advance for so long now because you have that whole NDIS paying system um, and mental health system. So the wait list for most of those therapists are huge. So you kind of get to be that in-between point a lot of the time. So, you know, your wait list might be nothing it might be six weeks but still shorter than um shorter than most of the other therapies so, so it, it can be a lot more immediate and you get to spend time with people you know that's our big advantage as kinesiologists is that we get to just sit and have time you know don't focus on your corrections that you need to do or the right way of of doing things you know i think as kinesiologists we can get a little bit fancy you know in trying to I did this and that, no, 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 no. Whereas really they just kind of need to be sat with and held. And the procedure I introduce into the course is, is really just hands-on and gentle. And um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a do this, do that thing. It's really about how to listen to the body and, and how, to open, how to open up those pathways without all the muscle testing, you know, the muscle testing and stuff. I, I very rarely do muscle testing now. Um, I think it just complicates things for me sometimes when, you know, humans are really quite simple. But you use it very much so in the beginning because you're still trying to understand things. So it's like a scaffolding, I call it. It, it helps you hold things. But... Um, what I introduce into the course is how to work really without that muscle testing as well, because kids as well, like trying to muscle test them can be a nightmare. <laughs> um, yeah. How's that going? Any other questions? Any other concerns? So really through the course, I go through the main issues as well that I see in clinic for each age group. Um, you know, so you've got from newborns, you know, your birth trauma, your feeding issues, your colic, your sleeping issues. And then I go on, you know, you've got ear infections, adenoids, toileting issues, um, and then into primary, you know, starting school, primary school, learning issues, um, bullying, grief, ADHD, um, separation, anxiety. You know, I, I kind of go into all different um all different procedures and things that we'll tend to see pop up at each age group and of course anxiety and stuff as well so I've tried to just mentally dump as much as I know into this course um and which is why I think you know once you sign up people often do it over and over and over again because and that's why I've left it that way because there is so much to digest and you'll get a wave of okay clients that I'll see that and I feel really comfortable with that but then how else and then you'll get something else roll through um yeah so I go through the really simple stuff and then the really complex issues as well how's that any other questions guys no <laughs> so please sign up <laughs> it's an awesome course um I've tried to make it as affordable and easy as possible I understand this year's been a bit crazy so if you want a different payment plan just let me know I'm really flexible I just want to get this out to as many people as we can um so yeah thank you <laughs> and once you've done this course then you can open up to the reflexes course as well or you can do it the other way around um or, or neither but you <laughs> <laughs> but there's heaps of support um I tend to find in that in the Facebook group that we have as well it's it's really beautiful and, and people are always posting 
things that are going on, you know, any advice, and it's a really supportive, beautiful space. Um, so the feedback I tend to get is that it changes the way that you work with adults as well. And, um, you know, even the inner child work, uh, you really understand the inner child a lot more. Um, I think because I'm really focused on the on the cause and the why of things, you know, it really simplifies a lot of. I've, I've basically given you how I work in clinic, and I think you'll find that if you go to a kinesiologist that's been practicing for a while, they really don't do a lot of the the stuff that um, that we learn in college anymore. So it it kind of gives you that package of okay, this is. This is how you end up working when you work intuitively and after a while and, and giving you that real basis of what it is that we're trying to achieve as kinesiologists as well. Um, Kelly, did you have something else to say? Uh, yes, with the, um, um, the procedure that you do just to calm the nervous system down, can that, if you get a really anxious adult, can you use that same procedure on them as well when they first yeah. walk in? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much... The procedure I do every session. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Adult yeah. style. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. No worries. But yeah. All right. There you go, guys. I think I've kind of downloaded all I, all I can for this morning. Hey, Tracy. Oh, hey. I was just going to say oh. thanks, Anne. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for joining me. And um, mm. yeah. Tell all your friends. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. Bye.